Welcome to Spotlight. I'm your host, Ryan Keating. Joining us today is one of New York's latest British imports, an author who has written books such as uh, How to Become a Virgin and Doing It with Style. However, he's best known for his first published literary effort, The Naked Civil Servant, which was made into an acclaimed television film starring John Hurt. Please welcome Mr. Quentin Crisp. Mr. Chris, welcome to Spotlight. It's Thank a you. pleasure to have you with us today. You're now living in New York City. Uh, having lived in England for some 70 odd years, uh, how does it feel to be uh, part of New York civilization? Well, I greatly prefer it. The moment I saw New York, I wanted it. But I wanted it e even before that because when I saw the movies, I wanted to be an American. And so the moment I got the chance, I came here. I could never come here unless my fare was paid. So I came in 1977 when I was invited to come here by Mr. Bennett. And then I came to work in MacDougall Street for three months in 78. And now I've been to various places, uh, either for one day just to do one performance, or for a few days or a few weeks, including Los Angeles, which is another earthly paradise. And, of course, the reason for wanting to live here is the people. I would never move from one place to another merely because of the climate or the tax structure or the scenery. I would only move for the sake of the people. How did your decision to pack up after 70 years in England evolve? and just totally transplant yourself? Oh, simply the opportunity to do so. Uh, for no other reason. I just got here. I saw that I might be able to get permission to live here and I set about it the first moment I had any free time. You've written that by nature you're an American. That notwithstanding, uh, did you find the transition difficult? Not really. Um, if I could, I would have brought my entire room from England to here. Because if you live in a room for 40 years, you get so used to it that you narrow down the process of living almost to nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, but now that I live in a room that's unfamiliar, I have to think about it and think where to put everything and where it is and where I did put it. And this is um, a disadvantage, but very slight. Now, I have no difficulty getting used to America. Well, one thing that's been written of you, that the British have never been very proud of you. They've treated you like the Queen of Queer Street. Whereas here in America, especially in New York, we treat you as if uh, you were the Queen Mum. Does that surprise you? It didn't surprise me. The extent of the um, indifference surprised me. But um, it is, of course, because I've been on television. That is what makes a difference in the eyes of Americans. Indeed, that is the meaning of the expression, how to become a virgin. Once you've been on television, you become sacred. All your past sins are taken away completely. Even if you've been on television because you murdered your mother, nobody will care. They will rush up to you in the street and say, we saw you on television because in some way this redeems you. Well, one thing that I was amused by when I rang you up to ask you if you would appear with us today is, was your cynicism of television. Oh, in what way do you think I'm cynical? I like television. I like watching it and I like being on it. Well, one thing you said was that you didn't understand that you didn't understand why people would sit and watch a box. I don't understand that they will watch it so persistently. I want it. But it seems that a great many people, not only here, but throughout the world, and certainly in England, watch television um, by default. That is to say, they must watch something. So they will, see pro they will sit in front of the television set and say, isn't it awful? But they still don't take their eyes from it. This I find strange. Mm -hmm. But, oh, almost every evening there's something I'm, I gladly see on television. In England, the best television is American, without any doubt. We do not have anybody on English television of the force and the magnitude of Mr. Savalas or Raymond Burr. I mean, Raymond Burr is now the same shape as the screen, so that nobody else is required at all. 
you owe, you owe a lot of your cult personality to, excuse me, cult personality to television due to uh, the film of The Naked Civil Servant and all your subsequent appearances. Yes. Okay, uh, when, let's talk about your first book. When you wrote it, it's been said that you did so to uh, get back at the British so society which had treated you so cruelly. This is quite untrue. Um, I never seek revenge. That's a complete waste of time. You are having all your work cut out trying to survive the treatment you receive. There's absolutely no point in trying to treat other people as badly as you've been treated. That's a complete waste of time. No, I wrote the book because I was told to. I have never done anything except what I was told to do. How was it received when it was first published in Britain? Well, now people like to say, which was a bestseller at the time, it was no such thing. It sold its edition, I imagine, which would be about 3,500 copies, and was fairly well received. But it wasn't until it became a television play that there was any real fuss. At what point did uh, the decision to turn it into a television film evolve? Well, the book came out in the very beginning of 68, and I think Mr. Mackey bought the movie rights in about 1970 or 71. Then he wrote his scenario and then he ran hatless through the streets of London for four years trying to raise the money to make it into a movie. And this he couldn't do. So in the end it was made into a television play. But this had its advantages because, as I say, people see it merely because the other programs are worse. Therefore it was shown to people who would never dream of thinking about the subject of my life. It would never have been seen by anybody except other homosexuals if it had been made into a movie. Did uh, the, the critical reaction to the film surprise you? I was amazed at it. I did think it a wonderful uh, television play, but I still didn't expect that people like Miss Banks Smith would say it justified the existence of television, which she did say. And I was amazed at the number of awards it won. But of course, you must remember that no credit belongs to me for the movie. The praise belongs to Mr. Mackey, who wrote it, to Mr. Gold, who made it, and to Mr. Hurt, who is now my representative on Earth. And how did you feel of his performance? Well, I was astounded that he was so, so conscientious about the entire thing. He allowed himself to be made over completely. He even plucked his eyebrows from underneath to increase the distance between the eyebrow and the eye. And he submitted to all that. Okay, one thing that you wrote in your first book was that you learned very early in your life that you were always going to need people more than they needed you. Yes. Now how does that fit in with your uh, your nature to uh, choose to lead a lifestyle for which you've had to sacrifice so many things including your livelihood and your uh, your friendships? It means that I accepted both. That I would live my life in my own, own way and that this would result in my needing people more than they needed me. That's one of the things you'll have to accept if you have decided that you will go on in your own way regardless of other people's feelings. You can quite fairly be accused of being selfish. It's quite a reasonable remark. So that you will have to accept both. You do have your freedom, and as you know, Mr. Elliot says, freedom is a different kind of pain from prison. And this is so. Uh, one of the pains of freedom is that you're likely to be lonely. And do you feel that your life has been lonely? No, I would say my life up to perhaps the age of 25 was lonely. But you see, at that time, uh, even the jobs I had, I did badly. So I felt a failure. People are only lonely if they don't know what to do with the time when they're alone or if they identify being alone with failing. And a lot of people do. It's absurd, but nevertheless they say, here am I sitting alone, I failed. Because the rest of the world is arranged so that people have friends or lovers or husbands or whatever. But once you've abandoned that idea, once you don't think I'm alone and therefore I failed, you merely think I'm alone and what shall I do with my time? then, of course, you no longer feel lonely. 
And indeed, I now have to live alone. I couldn't live with anybody. I mean, as it happens, I live in a very small room and there wouldn't be room for anybody else. But even if I lived in a palace, I would have to live alone. Because when would I recharge my batteries? Um, something that Oscar Wilde once said is that each man kills the thing that he loves. And this reminds me of your great dark man. Because on one hand, it's, it's a dream that you longed for. And on the other hand, it's something that seems very foreboding. Do you think the way that you chose to live your lifestyle had anything to do with the self-destruction of that dream? Oh yes, certainly. Um, first of all, of course, you cannot love that which you do not fear. But secondly, yes, uh, we're back where we started. If you live in a certain way, you're very unlikely to meet anyone who will be willing to uh, weave his life in with yours. I mean, the penalty is too great so that I had a great number of friends but they were inclined to say I think I'd better see you there which meant I don't want to walk through the streets with you which is fair enough so you weren't likely to meet anyone who would be known to a landlady or to the postman or the tradesman as being somebody who lived with you because it would be a terrible penalty Have you had many lovers in your lifetime? No, very few and no, nothing I think you would call an affair. That is to say, I never lived a life in which anyone said, come to my party and bring your friend. So that um, my problem really was never a sexual problem, only a personality problem. I was determined to live out my entire personality, some of which is feminine and some of which is masculine. Are you uh, a romantic person, or do you sort of scoff at the idea of love? I don't scoff at the idea of love. Um, I myself regard love as the extra effort that we make in our dealings with those whom we do not like. My view of love is that it's something you do, not something that falls out of the sky on you. Uh, it's an effort that you make, and that you are going to give any more of our attention caring, love, whatever you like to call it, to one person rather than another. It must be given to the unlovable. That is the least we can do, to even things up. I don't regard it, as I say, as some, a blinding flash that happens to you. Uh, that, I think, would come under the heading of being in love. And that, I must say, I think is a complete waste of time. Because you tend not only to accept people's faults, if you're in love with them, you tend actually to start to treasure their faults. And this, I think, is damnable. Just the same way as one should never treasure one's own faults, but one has to accept that there they are. You've once said that people should be allowed to dream up until the age of 25, and then what? Well, if you dream after the age of 25, if you dream about yourself, your future, after the age of 25, then it becomes an alibi and you never really settle down to doing anything you're always saying one day I will go to Africa and start a farm and you haven't even learned any farming you see this is nonsense so I think you're allowed your dreams to think I would like to do this I would like to do that and then one day whether it's at the age of 25 or not you have to say well now I've thought of all these things I'd like to do and I'd better pick on one of them and do it so that then you stop dreaming and you live. When you reached the age of 25, what did you decide to do? Well, I had already sat and decided from the very beginning that my life was simply being myself. And all the careers I've had were a failure. I never knew how to do anything. I've never been good at anything in my whole life. The best thing I did best was to be a model. And that at least I felt, well, I must be doing this right because the schools say do come back. And I think in being a model I was able to exercise my capacity for living inside my body for a, for a great length of time together with my willpower because it is a life of discomfort if not actual pain. And so you have to reckon that's the way it will be.
I mean, you might start to be a model thinking, oh, I look so beautiful, artists will long to paint me. Actually, it doesn't matter what you look like, just turn up and keep still. So once you've learnt that, then you think, what more could I do? And you look round the art room, trying to think of something, whether you could hang from the rafters, or whether you could roll on the floor, anything which will compel the students to take notice. Because they haven't come to the art school running toward art. They've come in backwards, trying to escape from real life. It's when their father says, and what are you going to do, that they say, what am I going to do? I know, I'll do art. And that puts off a decision for another four years. So if you're going to be a model, you have to compel them to look. And this you can only do by creating sort of anatomical conundrums. But you've sort of subscribed to that theory in terms of your everyday existence. Yes. Yes, it's all part of it. Does your father have anything to do with this? I don't think so. My father really retreated from life, I would say, certainly from family life. He didn't like people, and he didn't like children, and he really heartily disliked me. And he can't be blamed, because of course that was a terrible nuisance. I was always crying, I was always being sick. And furthermore, I was an added expense, because I was the youngest. And I think they hoped after the first two children that there wouldn't be any more. And the more children that were born, in the end there were four of us, the more money had to be spent. And this he did not like. And he lived and died in debt. At what age did you leave home? When I was 21, and he died within six months of that. So he never had to cope with my later life. One thing that's been said, that throughout your life you've been known for your passivity, and that's tided you through many a rejection. Do you advocate passivity as opposed to militancy? Well, I certainly don't advocate extreme militancy for anybody. Uh, because it will, no, not it will, it may produce a counterattack. If a minority shakes its fist in the face of the public, it raises the question, how can they afford to do this? How much power have they? How much money have they got? Are they armed? How many of them are there? Are they making their nests under the stairs? You see? So that you already you raise people to defend themselves from what from an attack which may never come. Uh, I think it's really in the nature of integration that you cannot fight for it. You can only wait. You've said that all political groupings tend to diminish the individual. Do you feel that minorities should uh, compromise on their individuality? I think this is unwise. But then, of course, I believe what my nature inclines me to believe, rather than what can be proved to me by logic. Of course there have been people who have started movements which have changed in some respect the circumstances and the society in which they live. And uh, they have grouped around them people who urged them forward uh, and su supported them financially or in some other way. But there is the danger that if you sink your individuality for the sake of some kind of political power, you will enter a ghetto just as bad as the ghetto you were in when your mother said, do cut your hair. There isn't all that much difference. You haven't compromised on your individuality? Well, I suppose I have at various times. Now I'm not asked to, so it's easy to be grand about this. I'm no longer worse than that. I'm encouraged to be my horrible self, whatever that may be. But I've tried not to. I've tried always to stay with the fundamental things about myself. Uh, throughout your life, you've had to make many sacrifices to maintain it, your individuality. Uh, why did you persevere when you know, it was not fashionable in a time to be gay? I think the real answer is that I had no choice. Um, I was a lost soul by the time I was five or six. Any modern um, psychiatrist, any modern rather knowing person would have looked at me and said something ought to be done about that child. Because I was swishing around the house in clothes that I'd found in some attic, say, um, 
clothes belonging to my mother or my grandmother. So that I was living in a dream, of course. I was either an awkward boy in the outer world, or else I was this mythical being, mostly feminine, living in my dream world. And there was really no chance that I would ever be able to disguise myself as a human being. None. I used to try. When you're young, one day you think, I'll try and make like a schoolboy. And then the next day you think, this is too humiliating, I won't bother. Then the persecution is so great that you go back to trying to to conform. And you do that until you finally think, this is absurd. I must stay in the middle, where I really belong. At what age did you realize that, that you must stay in the middle? Oh, I should think I was at least 24 or 5. Certainly I'd already come to London and was living alone and had learned how difficult my life was going to be. I knew I would pay a great price, but I didn't know how great the price would be. I didn't know I would live in danger, physical danger. And then I thought, well, if I'm going to do it, we must do it from end to end, from top to bottom, from start to finish. Um, One of the things that Oscar Wilde has said is, uh, in matters of great importance, it is not sincerity that counts, but style. Do you feel that one should compromise on sincerity? That was Mr. Wilde's great error, because to a real stylist, they're the same thing. He thought of style as a sort of glittering tinsel that falls onto rather banal material. But if you're a real stylist, your, your style uh, informs the subject matter. The subject matter is known through the style. They can't be separated. Because style is not elegance, and style is not flourishes, and style is not mannerisms. Style is who you really are and how you present it. Do you feel that you have style? No, I wouldn't say that I have style, but I do try. I do try to live in such a way that everything about me is all of a piece. Do you feel that style is inherent or that it's something that one must uh, attain? Oh, I think you must learn it. First of all, you have to learn what what your style is going to say, and then you have to say it. And you gather about you everything. The the habitat, the clothes, the voice, the movements, if possible, even the job, which represent your style. Having lived some 75 odd years, are you surprised at how your life has turned out? That after so many years of difficulty, all of a sudden you're accepted, that people look at you on the street and they, they treat you with respect? Oh, I'm absolutely astounded. And indeed, this would never have happened had I not come to America. Someone said to me the other day, are you more notorious in London than you are in New York? And I said, how would I know no one speaks to you in London? But everybody talks to you in New York. And what do they talk to you about? Anything. Or or sometimes quite ordinary things. You are not American, are you? No, you've come from England. Yes, do you like America? Quite ordinary things. Or else they have, they know who I am and they say they've seen me on television and uh, and they say they agree with what I say or they say whatever made you say this, that or the other. And um, you see, Americans like you to succeed because they feel you will drag them forward with you. One thing you were mentioning is the difference between the way you were treated in England and the way you're treated here. Do you find the attitude towards sexuality itself different? Um, I don't think I really know, because you see, um, the treatment I receive is no key to that, because I've entered the category of being a funny old gentleman. My sex is really of almost of no importance whatsoever now. If I were younger, this might not be so. Uh, Yes, I do think that um, the difference is not between America and England, but of course between the young, the modern young, who believe in sex almost like a religion, and the young, when I was young, who were worried about it. So that's the, the difference is the time. Rather, rather than the place. But the difference is that Americans are friendly people. 
Regarding the uh, outlook on the sexuality, do you feel that with your life that the issue was the sexuality itself, being homosexual, or the fact that you wanted to, um, to dress up, so to speak? I think the great sin was my effeminacy, which in those days was the same thing in the minds of the public as homosexuality, which is absurd. But nevertheless, even I fell into this error because the only people I saw in London when I came there and knew were homosexual were the people who looked homosexual. So I too thought that all homosexuals were like me, which of course is daft. But this is certainly what the English thought. If you say to an English person, if you were going to meet someone known to be a man known to be homosexual, what would you expect? And he would reply, somebody like Quentin. But, of course, this is actually absurd. What they hated was the effeminacy, because Englishmen do not like women. I don't mean that they're homosexual. I mean, they really don't like the society of women. They don't like... Um, they like to be with men. They like to talk about subjects which they consider to be men's subjects. All these things are now breaking down. Uh, but at one time there was a whole catalogue of ideas, occupations, clothes, words, which were suitable for a man. And another catalogue, which was suitable for a woman. And so mothers were forever saying, little girls do not climb up trees, or whatever the thing is. And this, of course, they fostered, they, they kept alive this vast difference which came into existence in Victorian times. Then you really knew a woman was a woman and she had her skirt out to here. Mm -hmm. And any idea that this concealed her sexuality, of course, is absurd because she had to pick the whole thing, damn thing up. She couldn't have sit, sat in this chair without picking the whole thing up. Her legs were always on view and then carefully concealed. So this coyness... Um, emphasize the idea of, of that a woman is a frail creature, uh, timid, unduly susceptible, um, and that a man is really fundamentally a swine who can be got to behave nicely. Mr. Crisp, it's been a pleasure. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation with Quentin Crisp and it has broadened your horizons and you've been entertained. If you have any comments or suggestions, you can write to myself. I'm Ryan Keating in care of Perot Productions, 640 10th Avenue, New York, New York, 10036. Until next week, this is Ryan Keating for Spotlight. Mm -hmm.